welcome to my sewing room. We have such an exciting show for you today. My guest will be Eileen Roach. Eileen is editor of Designs and Machine Embroidery, the magazine that is produced by Great Notions out of Dallas, Texas. Now, let me share with you some exciting machine embroidery. This little doll, Cecil Elizabeth, has a miniature machine embroidery for dolls and for babies. The tiny little design made just to fit on a doll collar and tiny little designs to go around the bottom of her sweet little calico dress, all done in miniature for those who love to do miniature. Now, you know I love dolls. Here is a little doll pillow, once again with a little miniature heart and little miniature flowers and miniature bluebirds. So sweet. And here is a little doll quilt made for the 18-inch doll, done with little gingham, a gingham bow, uh, applique down, and little miniature embroidery designs. Once again, the little miniature heart. Now this is a very interesting concept in machine embroidery. This is a tea cozy and it has all kinds of trees and houses and, and lakes and, and a little uh, cobblestone path. And some of the items on here are not uh, machine embroidered at all, but rather they're done with a permanent marking coloring pen. Very, very interesting. And by the way, all of this is done with a small embroidery hoop, not a big hoop. Eileen shared with me one of the most wonderful machine embroidered pieces that I think I've ever seen. This is done with a wood grain fabric and actually Eileen ran the wood grains up and down and sideways. One of the most interesting parts of this wall hanging, except it, it's hung really low by the way, down on the floor almost where her daughter plays. She has a 10 year old daughter and this is her daughter's china cupboard. Now this background, which looks like gives it some depth, is black netting which has been fused onto what is going to be the cabinet areas, the, the shelf areas, and then the different teapots and teacups have been embroidered on. Once again, this was all done with a small embroidery hoop. One of the most interesting pieces from Eileen's collection, I think, this is double needle machine embroidery. Once again, it has been hooped 10 times. The small piece that went in was about right here, and also Eileen used black and brown thread for that interesting machine embroidery. This is a beautiful, beautiful jacket. Now it looks as if Eileen had a very huge embroidery hoop. She did not. She used the uh, roses and the stems and this long stem that goes all the way down the jacket is simply a zigzag, a heavy zigzag, and then she's placed her small embroideries randomly around the zigzag. And now to learn some more of these exciting and new techniques, won't you come along with me to the technique boards? This is such a new concept and I think one you will really like. First of all, we're going to have an antique photo or antique picture which is on a transfer and they hear all the directions on how to transfer it. We have already transferred this antique photograph here, the mother and the little girl holding out her arms. You will see this is just a picture. It has no machine embroidery on it. Now, just watch. The machine embroidery has been designed to go exactly with this picture. One of the cutest things is the little chatelaine. The lady has a chatelaine on. If there are birds flying in the sky, the little girl has a ribbon. And these wonderful flowers, which are actually on the antique picture, have been made to embroider to go right over the picture. Now this is a very new and an exciting concept brought to us today by my friend and business colleague Eileen Roach. Eileen is editor of Designs and Machine Embroidery magazine produced by Great Notions out of Dallas, Texas. Eileen, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thank you for having me, Martha. It's always a oh, pleasure. Oh, it's fun to, to have here. you again. Show me what you're going okay. to have for us today. Well, this is a really new, exciting concept in machine embroidery. And one of the reasons why it's so um, professional looking is because it comes with templates that enable you to get the perfect placement of your embroidery. But the first thing that you need to do is transfer the iron-on transfer to your fabric. So you cut your fabric in the dimension that is required and then you place the um, iron-on transfer image side down into the center of your fabric. 
First, you would want to remove any wrinkles or lint that was on the existing fabric before you actually place um, the iron on. You press it down for 30 seconds and you constantly move a gentle back and forth motion. And after 30 seconds, you then release and then turn it around like this. And this um, enables you to overlap the ironing position. After you completely um, cover the whole desi design, you then go around and seal the edges. And this is extremely important. And one of the great things about this uh, iron-on transfer is that the directions are right here on the wrong side. <laughs> so um, <laughs> as you, yeah, if you forget, you're, you're OK. So we have one that has already been transferred. And um, it's important that you wait until the whole fabric and the transfer is cool before you remove the paper backing. And then you have your image completely transferred. Now it's time to go to the embroidery. And I have already hooped um, my design in the, in the hoop that's a uh, five by seven. And this size hoop enables me to do the entire transfer in just two hoopings. I've already done my top, so I have the trees in the background, the little flower on her dress. And now I'm going to go and put this onto the machine so you can see exactly how we're going to work with the template. Now the template that is in place is the one that comes with the machine. And what that helps me do is line up um, the design in the hoop. I just want to make sure that it's square in the hoop because the machines, most machines today, have the ability to move to the start position of each embroidery. So I'm going to snap this in place and I can remove this hoop, I mean this template from the hoop. And now I have the template that comes with the embroidery. Now you can see it's in a gray image, but it's an actual size and it does have two different crosshairs and they're for um, specific machines instructions do come with it. So now I'm going to go and place that bow right on the back of her dress and I'm going to move up to the right position and what I want to do is have the needle so that it's going to penetrate that hole, that, that pre-drilled hole. And I think I need to come over just one or two millimeters. And once I have that perfect position I make sure that my thread is the right color and I can go and start my embroidery. That's just easy enough to do. Isn't it great? It is so exciting the way today's machines and the companies all have made it easy. And I think that uh, the biggest problem for people is the fear of placement. And by making it easy for the consumer, they're able to just go and fly with all of this great embroidery. Oh, I mean, I just love this new concept of the antique photographs and mm. the embroidery made to go on top. And you know what? This will be so pretty. I, would, I think pictures, just pictures on the wall. Right. It can be mm -hmm. used so many places. Mm -hmm. And now, Eileen, has a wonderful treat for you, a special home deck item for the baby. As a grandmother who has 10 grandchildren and two on the way, Eileen, I can tell you I would love to have this in any of my grandchildren's rooms. Tell us about it. Okay, well this is what I call a mother's memory board. And what it is, is the embroidery scape is in the center. And I have just taken um, basically cardboard, and I'll show you that and upholstered the cardboard. And then I put some decorative gimp with upholstery tacks, making these little diamond shapes. And in each diamond shape, I've put um, the announcement of the birth of the child. This is the little card that goes in the crib, you know, in the nursery, in the hospital. A photograph. This is um, the mother's hospital bracelet and a little bookmark commemorating the birth of the child. So this interesting cardboard is called Homosote, and it's available in your local um, hardware store. It comes in large sheets, about four by eight, and it's about a half an inch thick. So it's very sturdy, and you want it to be sturdy so that you can actually put those upholstery tacks in it and that they'll stay and not pop out like they would in styrofoam, which is oh, nice yeah. and lightweight, oh, yeah. but they don't stay uh -huh. in. So the first thing you want to do is cut some batting that's about four inches larger than the whole perimeter of your home soap board. And then you're going to use a staple gun to attach the batting on the wrong side. I do like to use um, an electric staple gun because they're really hard on your hand. And on this one, uh, we're a little bit further along, and what I've done is centered my uh, decorative fabric with the embroidery scape. And then I have gone and pulled very taut and stapled the three sides. And then for the last side, I would pull this very tight and then staple the remainder aside. 
You can then go and put plain fabric behind it to make it a little bit more pretty in the back. <clears throat> so now that we have one completely upholstered, it's time to do the decorative trim. And I just started down on one column on the left hand side and I gently put the first tack in just to hold it because I'm going to have to remove that later so that I can um, put the other end of the gimp into it. So once I have gone and secured this in here, I even take a little hammer and tack mm -hmm. it in mm -hmm. because, you know, we only get one set of fingers. <laughs> and the <laughs> and hammer is yeah. pretty easy. <laughs> so then I go down to the center of the scape as a um, marking point and I'll tap this one in and again down like this. And I'll continue the whole side and then I'll just come back. Making the little sections to put right. all your treasures mm -hmm. in. Eileen, those of us that love heirloom sewing love treasures so much. And mothers and grandmothers, you know how we like that sort of thing. This is a right. wonderful idea. Okay. We're going to push that back push and that. tack it in. Yep, and, and then crisscross all the way up. Another tack here, one here, here, and finish the job. You know, Eileen, what I love so much, and I want you to kind of put your finger on that embroidery design, mm -hmm. what I envision. I would love just those little flowers to oh, do the yeah. nursery right. and to do those little flowers on mm -hmm. the crib skirt and Absolutely. to maybe even do them on a bumper pad right. and then do a pillow with the, with the mother and the child mm -hmm. there and then maybe do wall hangings. I just think right. this would be a really elegant little girl's nursery yeah. especially. There's so many pieces that you can pull from it and use, you know, like it's, just it's, the trees well, and those, those little floral that has poetry. Iris and daisies mm -hmm. and poppies and tulips. Yeah. Eileen, thank you so much for being with me today and for sharing sharing these wonderful ideas about embroidery scapes. Thank you, Martha. And next I have a beautiful doll dress for you. This spoke collar doll dress is so beautiful on the doll named Cecil Elizabeth. The little spoke collar is so pretty and has a little hand embroidery, but of course if you have a miniature embroidery, you could do it by machine. You know, I think we'll just call this skirt a spoke skirt also. See how pretty the spokes are coming with the, the double layers of lace down and then the little hand embroidery or machine embroidery also. And then I want you to see the little petticoat, which I think is so sweet. It has just a plain batiste skirt and then the layers of insertion and the gathered edging. An absolutely magnificent doll dress that you can do hand or machine embroidery. Now I would like to share with you how that spoke skirt is made. First of all, I trace off the sections of the skirt with the straight line and the straight line and my lines for folding back the miters and the lace look a little peculiar, but that's the way they're supposed to look. And then I draw the scallops on the bottom. Now, first of all, I'm going to do two layers of uh, lace insertion. This is French lace insertion. It's done in ecru. This is what I wanted to share with you, how I'm going to do this spoke and the curved lace down here. All right, I've got to put a miter at this point. That, something's going to have to happen to that lace and it's going to need to be a miter. So I put a pin at the bottom and a pin out here on this line I have drawn. I fold it back on itself, remove the pin that goes through two layers, the outside pin, and bring the lace around. And now I'm ready to curve the lace on the next scallop. And the way I do that is just pull my pins around here, make a nice curve, and then when I get all the way around into the curve, I will come in and pull the gathering thread on the French lace. Let me slip my pin underneath that gathering thread and grab it. And then I'm going to pull, or rather I hope I'm going to pull. I don't think I got quite a long enough piece. I'm going to pull the thread and it will lay down perfectly into a scallop. Now the next step is to zigzag all three of the sides of these two pieces of lace insertion and then zigzag the top only of the lace that goes around the scallop. Then in order to make it a scallop skirt rather than a straight skirt on the bottom, I will simply come in and trim away this excess skirt. Now the final step on the scallop part of the skirt will be to put gathered lace edging onto the bottom and I'm going to simply butt it up, I, gather, I pull the pull thread or the string in the lace, I butt it up to the curved lace insertion 
and then I'm going to slip more gathers underneath there. All right, let me hold up the, pull up the presser foot, and I'm going to get some more gathers and slip a few more gathers in here. There you go. I'm going to take my little shish kebab stick and push them a little bit more. Straighten out my lace here. It likes to curl up like some, like some spaghetti, so you have to kind of uncurl it every now and then. Lower the presser foot, and with my shish kebab stick, once again, I will place my gathers, and I will zigzag. And that's what you do when you put gathered lace on the bottom of anything. You just sort of play with it. Distribute your gathers, lift up the press of foot anytime you need to. Now let's go back. The way I'm going to do the petticoat underneath this scallop skirt is simply to butt the laces together, gather the edging on the bottom, zigzag all of them together, and then attach it to the skirt, and then I have my underskirt on this beautiful doll dress. And next we have some hand embroidery stitches for you. It is my great pleasure today to welcome my very dear friend, Kathy Neal, to the show. Kathy is one of the world's most renowned hand sewing teachers, hand embroidery teachers, and it is always a pleasure to see her beautiful work, and it's always a pleasure, too, to have her teach at my school in Huntsville because our students love you so much, Kathy. Thanks, Martha. Thank you so much for being here today. It's always great <laughs> being in your sewing room. Today, I would like to share with you a hand technique Fagoting, and fagoting is a wonderful decorative stitch that joins two folded edges. It's especially nice on small areas like the collar of the day gown that we have here. In order to do successful fagoting, of course we need two folded edges. You can get that on straight pieces by folding them like so, and if you need bias pieces to go around a curve, you might want to use one of these bias tape makers to make your bias strip and then fold it in half and fag it the folded edges together. As you see, you can um, work this into almost any shape you want to with a steam iron. Um, the thread that you use will determine whether or not you want to wax your thread. If you're using sewing thread, sometimes rubbing it over a cake of beeswax will make the stitches go more smoothly. But today we're using floche, and we're using a nice big needle to demonstrate this. And so we aren't going to wax that thread today. Um, in order to keep the two edges stable while we stitch on it, we want to, um, first of all, so face down our edges, whether it's the collar or whether it's just two strips of fabric, sew it face down to just a piece of paper. This is just ordinary typing paper. And this keeps it stable while we work the stitch. Now you'll always want to make sure that you have it measured so that there's an equal distance. Now, if you have trouble judging the distance between stitches to assure uniformity, you might even want to take a wash away or air erasable marker and mark um, equal distances on your edges. But to begin this stitch, we just make a nice big fat knot on the end of our thread because remember, our fabric is face down. And in order to do this stitch, we simply start and take a bite on the bottom edge of the fabric and it catches the knot right there. Just remember the needle always stays ahead of the thread and when we go up and nip the top edge, the thread stays above and when we go down to nip the bottom edge, the thread stays below each time. And by working this stitch along these two edges, we get a nice joined decoration. And it's such a nice tailored stitch, Martha, for little boys' garments and such. And you see you get this nice zigzag, almost a hem-stitched look. And if you'll notice over here on our day gown, we would have begun by either basting with long machine stitch or with hand stitch. We basted the collar down and then basted our little bias band around. Now on something this fine, you would want to use a really fine sewing thread like a 50 weight silk finish. But it gives such a nice decorative dainty touch to these wonderful baby clothes that we're doing 
this time. You know, Kathy, the baby clothes, it's beautiful on the baby clothes, but I'll tell you what, I have several antiques where there's ladies' blouses have had that used too. It's a very round historical round. Oh, it's a very historical stitch, and I've seen it also used on things for home decorating. Kathy, this baby day gown is so pretty with that tiny little pink uh, bias tubing, I suppose. Tubing. Is that what you call it? A bias, bias tubing, faggoted on so the collar. So that it can curve. Well, sure. Oh, it's so pretty. Kathy, thank you so much for teaching about one of my favorite stitches, faggoting. Thank you. And now, won't you join me in my attic? This hand faggoted blouse I purchased at Portobello Road in London. It has absolutely a beautiful collar. The hand faggoted bias strips start at the top of the collar. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then the strips come all the way down the, to make a beautiful round yoke. There's entredeau that has been added, and then a wonderful strip of lace, and then another strip of, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, pin tucks all the way across. The beautiful strips go all the way down to the bottom of the blouse, that pretty, pretty hand lace. I think they call that lace chemical lace, and I'm not sure what it is, but I think that's what it's called. Then the sleeve is equally as pretty. The three tucks, the two pieces of chemical lace, the three tucks, and look at the details on that sleeve. Isn't that pretty? Just sets of tucks all the way around, and then the pretty lace on the bottom. As is so true of the Victorians, the blouses are just as beautiful on the back as they are on the front. I always love to show you the surprise on the back, because sometimes today I think we just put our embellishment on the front and maybe leave the backs really plain, but not the Victorians. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful back of a blouse? For our Sewing from the Heart today, I have a wonderful letter from Myrna Maglioni from Idlewild, California. Dear Martha, this concerns Rosie Gonzalez, owner of Rosie's Calico Cupboard Quilt Shop in La Mesa, California. Rosie has taken on a major project for children with cancer. She firmly believes any child and their sibling should have a special handmade quilt. She personally delivered 169 such quilts this week. They are made by special quilters from all over California and some from outside of California. Rosie travels to quilt guilds and has workshops where the ladies put together the tops with Rosie's help. Then they are taken back to her shop to be assembled and quilted. This is a monumental task for Rosie, her staff, and the people that love to buy in her store. At each guild, Rosie also receives a check for her services made out to the Cancer Fund. The project Rosie supports is called Camp Reach for the Sky. She is very special and we are very blessed to have such a great example to follow. Thank you for your time and I hope you will acknowledge her dedication. Sincerely, Myra, excuse me, Myrna Maglioni of Idlewild, California. Uh, Myrna, this was quite a special letter about Rosie Gonzalez and and the people there at Rosie's Calico Cupboard. And you know what I really loved was not only the fact that Rosie spends her own time doing these quilts, but she travels and teaches. And then instead of getting money for her teaching, she gets a check made out to the Cancer Fund. I really admire Rosie and all of you ladies out in California that are making these quilts for children with cancer. And, and I know probably you get a whole lot more uh, pleasure out of this than almost any type of sewing you could do. Rosie, thank you so much for your contribution. Myrna, thank you so much for writing. And mostly, I want to thank all of you who have come to join me in my sewing room today. We absolutely love doing this show for you. And from your letters to us, you've told us that you enjoy receiving these shows also. Thank you for coming. We'd like to invite you back next time.